Um, most of you, I presume, have used Motkit. Um, if you haven't, um, I would say it's a perfect chance to check it out, but you should be checking out Percona Toolkit instead. Um, and Bill will explain why. Um, but it's an awesome set of tools uh, that we highly recommend. Um, do we have next month's stuff up? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so next month, we have MySQL HA Reloaded, old tricks and cool new tools to guarantee high availability. That's on December 7th, Wednesday. Um, same time, we're going to try again having it down the street at IGN. Um, after next month's uh, event, I'll send around a quick survey um, so everybody can kind of give us some feedback about whether or not they prefer it here or there. Um, I think there's pros and cons to both facilities. Um, and since the group's about you all, uh, you get to decide. Um, anybody have any announcements about community events? Looking to be hired? Looking to hire someone? Anything like that? Go for it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I gotta say your Azure Cloud guys last night. Oh sure, sure. Yeah? Yeah, you solved the problem from like No really. Yeah. I checked that for like I'm the cloud expert, there's one group in the next Cool. Um anyone else? All right, cool. Oh, go for it. From the Berlin office, just visiting. And we're Welcome. Always, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we're always searching for people around the engineering side of you, also in the San Francisco. We have an office here uh, if you're up for it. So, ping me. Cool, cool. Oh, yeah, there we go. I'll join the shout outs. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm from Wikimedia, hosting Wikipedia. Uh, we're hiring for a data analytics and uh, architect position deal with crunching the enormous amount of data that we get about people reading uh, all sorts of interesting articles. Cool, cool. And then to wrap things up, our sponsors tonight. Uh, thanks to CBS Interactive for hosting the facilities. Um, IGN um, has provided my time uh, for organizing um, and the beverages. Percona has provided the food. Uh, we have a bunch of books to raffle off tonight from O'Reilly. Um, a few shirts from Continuant. Continuant's working on a uh, logo and some signs for us. Um, Percona, you know, I mentioned for the food, also, you know, Bill's time for the, for the talk. Um, O'Reilly for the books, and that's everybody, I think. All right, good. Well, on that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, and uh, let's enjoy the talk. Cool. Thanks very much. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We've got a great turnout. I was a little bit worried about that because it's November, but uh, thanks for coming. So we're going to be talking about Percona Toolkit uh, tonight. And I've been looking at this title slide for enough time, so I'm just going to advance. I've been a MySQL developer and database administrator for about 10 years, uh, software developer in general for about 20 years. I've used other databases as well, Postgres, Interbase, Informix, and so on. Currently, I'm uh, working for Percona. I've been there for about a year now uh, as a consultant in the US and uh, also doing training. And that's been uh, developing recently. So I'm going to be uh, changing roles, uh, split my roles uh, between consulting and training going on. And last year, I published my first book called SQL Anti-Patterns, Avoiding the Pitfalls of Database Programming. And if you stay till the end, there's a uh, discount code if, in case you're interested in my book. You can get it in uh, uh, hard copy or in ebook formats. So Matkit, I mean Percona Toolkit. Some of you may be familiar with a, a product that's been out for quite some time called Matkit that is a collection of scripts that are very useful for database administrators to use in their daily work. We use it in our daily work at Percona, uh, so I'm using these on a daily basis. So 
what is Percona Toolkit? It's a set of, of scripts that help you every day with the tasks that you have to do. Things that you probably could do on your own, but it would be very tedious to do. This helps you automate a lot of it. A lot of the uh, frequent tasks that you need to do uh, related to development of uh, database schemas, profiling queries and uh, uh, activity on the database, managing your configuration, monitoring resource use, and configuring replication and filling in some of the gaps of functionality the replication doesn't have. I mentioned MapKit. That's been out for quite some time and also a, a companion product developed by the same people called Esperza. MapKit was Perl scripts, Esperza was all shell scripts. And we've decided to merge them and rebrand them as Percona Toolkit. So it's still open source, it's still the same code, and uh, same people working on it. It's just a new name and hosted on a different uh, source repository where you can go check it out, launchpad slash Percona dash toolkit. I'll show you a little bit more on that later. One of the things that's always impressed me about MatKit is that it's so easy to install. There's no dependencies, uh, very, very light use of Perl modules. And you can download it uh, as an RPM or installable deb package or just a tarball just with a simple wget command. We do have a Percona repository for our enhanced MySQL server called Percona Server. And Percona Toolkit is not yet in that repository, but that's coming. Another useful way to use this is if you only are interested in one of the individual tools in the toolkit, you can get that with a also a wget command. And that's really useful for me as a consultant. When I go on to a, a, a customer's server to try to diagnose something quickly, and I, I know just the tool that I need, I'm SSH'd into that server, and I need to do that quickly, I get just the one tool that I need. It downloads in seconds, and I am up and running to do that. No additional dependencies to install, uh, no uh, RPM hell, nothing like that. So what's in Percona Toolkit? Since this has merged the former MatKit and the former Asperza packages, there's a lot of tools in there. And I'm going to try to cover all of them. So I hope everybody has parking paid up until midnight, 1 AM. <coughs> so OK, no, just kidding. I'm going to uh, cover all of them lightly and delve deeply into a few of them, uh, the ones that I use most frequently. So I, I think of the tools in a number of sort of subgroups. These are just my own uh, way of thinking of them that uh, I use, use to group them. The first one I ca call development tools, things that I would use as a developer to try to uh, make sure that I'm uh, uh, on target with the good schema design. So I'll cover these each. This is a useful tool, duplicate key checker. The PT I'm going to treat as silent for the purposes of this talk. So duplicate key checker is a way to analyze a schema statically and tell you which keys and indexes are uh, no longer needed because they duplicate or are redundant with other indexes. It also works for foreign keys. If you, MySQL permits you to declare indexes and foreign keys that are uh, duplicate or uh, subsumed by each other, and this will find them for you. Something you could do on your own, but this will do it for you in two seconds. When you run this tool against your uh, local host, that's the default usage of it, so you don't have any uh, options or arguments to know about. You just run it on the command line, duplicate key checker, and it outputs for you a uh, textual output that shows you why it thought some indexes were redundant. And then <coughs> at the end, it shows you that the alter table statement that is required to remove that index. Quite useful. You could literally pipe this directly into the MySQL command line tool, and it would execute all the alter tables and remove the indexes. However, it's probably a good idea to look at it first. <laughs> I did, I did come across one instance where it uh, dropped an index and then recreated the exact same index. So, uh, but that was fixed long ago. So what is the output here? What are we looking at? It shows us, in this case, that there's uh, a subject node ID, that, which is the name of an index, is a left prefix of another index, which is simply called index in this example. 
it shows us the definitions of those two indexes. And you see that subject node ID is a single column index on that sing, uh, subject node ID column. The other index is a multiple column index. But the, the leftmost column is the same column as the, that in the single column. So why do we have the index on that single column? There, it's not necessary. Therefore, and it uh, shows you what the column types are in case you're interested, in case that uh, factors into your decision whether or not this is a good idea, idea we want to drop the index that's the single column index. Very handy. I ran this on one of my customers' databases. It's a two terabyte database and identified 400 gigabytes of duplicate indexes that they, that they uh, were running. So uh, then the task becomes, when do we uh, have a time to remove those? Because it's going to take a long time. But at least we know. This will also show you redundant foreign keys. MySQL will permit you to create two foreign keys on the same columns referencing the same table. And it doesn't complain at you when you do that, but you should probably go back and check once in a while to make sure that that hasn't happened, and you can remove some of your foreign keys that way. Online schema change. This is an extraordinarily useful tool, or has the potential to be. It's fairly new. It's come out in the last few months. A uh, number of implementations out there on, on the web and different toolkits but ours is being actively developed and has a test suite associated with it. So it's, it's getting to be much more stable than some of the other implementations. The idea of online schema change is that you can permit ongoing activity on your table while it's restructuring it into a, a different format. So you can alter it to add a column or add or drop an index, change the storage engine, any of those types of uh, activities. And what, how it does this is it leaves the table alone, creates an empty table adjacent to it, and restructures that one, and now starts piping the data into it, a uh, block at a time uh, from your original table while you're c continuing to use the original table. Any changes that are going on concurrently are captured by triggers and also applied to your new restructured table. And then once it's all done, it swaps it. So much less downtime for uh, doing an online schema change than you would otherwise have to bear for a large table. Query Advisor. This allows you to uh, analyze your log file of all the queries that you have and have run in the past. And it gives you hints about things that maybe are designed poorly in your queries. It has many different heuristics of uh, things to look for, just stylistically uh, SQL that's poorly constructed. And here's just a few examples. MySQL permits you to do um, non-deterministic group buys, where you can have columns in the select list that give you ambiguous results. You've probably all seen that. This will notice those and report them to you. So you can analyze your whole log file to find those cases and, and uh, get some advice about that. Inefficient queries, such as ordering by an expression which is not indexable, and improper use of outer joins that, uh, <coughs> where you're treating it as an inner join because you're making reference to some of the outer columns in your where clause. So, and many more. Some of them are pretty trivial, uh, things like uh, expressions with no alias, but others can be quite useful. And it's up to you to uh, analyze that and decide which ones are worthwhile changing. Show grants. How many people uh, manage user permissions and grants on multiple servers that should, be, it should have identical permissions, but it's hard to compare them because they're declared in different orders and with different uh, uh, groups of permissions at a time? The show grants command allows you to output what are the current privileges and users on that server, and it sorts them and puts them out in a sensible order. So now you can take the grants and users from two different servers and compare them easily. Or you can put them under source control and manage them that way, or, or uh, uh, have a canonical representation to put into Puppet. Again, something you could do yourself given enough time, but who has enough time? Any questions on that? I'm open to questions as we go, too, so feel free. Upgrade. 
Does this perform an upgrade? Well, not yet. Does this tell you if you have any reason why you should not upgrade? That's what it's for. It allows you to point this script at two different servers that have the same data in them, and it will run uh, the queries that are in your log file against those two servers simultaneously and tell you if there's any drastic differences in the result set, performance, or errors and warnings. So now you can do some regression testing before you upgrade. So this would be, a, typically you would do this in a, a development test environment. You'd have a snapshot of your database on 5.0, slaving to a, uh, another test database on 5.1, and you're trying to determine if the queries in your log on your site can be safely run against 5.1 as they were against 5.0. So that you port your log over there, run it through upgrade to uh, test it against these two servers simultaneously, and now you get your results. And you say, oh, this one query has a regression. It runs 20 times slower on 5.1. Uh, Why is that? Well, you investigate and you find out. Good? There's some also, also some profiling tools. Can I ask one quick question? Sure. Imagine getting the log, and, and this is a more general question, but um, my understanding is that you can either get the log by setting the, the uh, flow query time, time to zero seconds, um, or what? Because it seems like, you know, for our databases, if I did that, the disk I.O. would just be, would swamp the server. Um, is there some other way to sample queries or something like that? Yes. How do you do it? Okay, I'll tell you. I'll repeat the question for the sake of the... So the question is about uh, how do you get that the log of queries with which to test? Because if you were to try to capture all your queries, in the, either in the general query log or if you tune the, the long query time down to zero so it's effectively capturing all your queries, that would be too much. It would make the, the log file really big and it would overtax your, your I.O. system. So I do a number of things. Uh, one is do it uh, briefly. Uh, <laughs> turn the long query time down to zero for two minutes and see if that gives you enough uh, sampling of your queries to, to use for testing. Another thing you can do is TCP dump. You can capture queries off the wire directly with TCP dump uh, with uh, another one of the tools, uh, Query Digest. You can uh, sample queries using Show Process List, which also the Query Digest tool will do for you. Uh, and in Percona Server, there are features to do sampling of the slow query log. You can say, yes, I want to see all the queries, even if they take zero seconds, but only output 1% of them. And that's a feature in Percona Server. Is that, does that answer your question? It does. Um, I can ask EngineYard this, but uh, is uh, EngineYard supporting Percona Server? That I don't know for certain. So. Pardon? Query profiling thing, you're gonna, are you going to talk about that later on more, in more detail? The, uh, yeah, okay. that's going to be in the next, another group a little bit later, the Query Digest tool. Okay, so profiling tools. Oh, sorry, you have a question. Yeah, so I was wondering a little about the online community. Like, is there, is there such a community? Is there such a It's so new. The, the online schema change tool is so new that uh, I haven't had an opportunity to use that in production yet. I've used it in a couple of test cases, but uh, I'm, I'm still getting, uh, getting my courage up to use that in production. Does it require double the space of, uh, of the table to do a complete copy of all of the data before swapping? Or does it do something sort of real time where it can move some data and then not reference it in the old one? Okay, does online schema change require duplicate storage of the entire table while it's doing that? Yes. It does not siphon away data from the original table as it builds the one because you still need to potentially do queries against the original table uh, that could reference any row in that table uh, before you finished restructuring it into the new table. So it, it can't do away with e even partial amounts of the uh, original table until it's done restructuring it. But that's no different than an altered table in terms of storage util, uh, usage. An altered table, when it does a table restructure, will briefly require effectively double the, uh, or approximately double the storage of the single table. Right? 
Oh, we have an answer for you. Engine Yard is using Percona. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So index usage. We talked about duplicate key checker earlier, but index usage is a little bit different. This also analyzes your query log, does explains for you for every single query in your query log, and then identifies some of the indexes in your schema that are not used at all. So we saw earlier the one that finds uh, truly redundant indexes. This is the one that is not finds indexes that are not used by any of the queries that are currently in your log. That's not necessarily the case that uh, you never need that index, so you should review the output. Um, it could be that your log just doesn't happen to contain the query that uses that index. You want to get a reasonably sized good sample of queries in your log to run it through this tool. The output of this is very similar to the duplicate key checker. It gives you a series of explanations in comments with alter table statements to remove the uh, indexes that it feels are no longer needed. PMP is an implementation of an idea that started out at poormansprofiler.org. It's a tool that allows you to attach to a running process using GDB and get a stack trace with uh, numbers to indicate how much time it's spending in different uh, areas of the code. So this can give you some visibility as a, as a debugging tool on a running MySQL instance. The key thing here to know is that it will actually pause the execution of the running MySQL instance while it's gathering its data. So uh, don't, don't necessarily think you can do this live on a hot server that's being used. But typically people would use this on a system that's already halted for some reason. <laughs> okay, visual explain. This one is cool. And instead of explaining it to you, I'm just going to show it to you. So we've all done this and seen this uh, horrendous output of explain plan in uh, MySQL. It's so hard to read. Wouldn't it be better to look like this? So now you can see things without all the line wrapping, and you can get some of the uh, information with much more understandable labels, like <coughs> index lookup instead of ref. <laughs> ref sounds like a dog barking or something, but this one is m much clearer. And also, by the uh, indication of, of the nesting of the tables by this pseudo graphical output, it shows you the order in which you're, it's doing the joins which is sort of implicit in the uh, uh, explain plan, but this spells it out for you much more clearly. And if you do much more complex queries that's with unions and subqueries and things, this becomes even more useful. Tools to help you with configuration. So we have multiple database servers. We want to know what's different between them because we want to make sure that they're in sync. We have dozens of servers to manage, and we want to make sure that we don't have any discrepancies between them. How do we do that? Well, we could go through it line by line by hand, which will take us all day, or we could run this config diff with a data source naming for two different servers running MySQL, and it will just output in, uh, the comparison that it found on the running servers. In my case, I have two virtual machines, Huey and Dewey, and it outputs what it finds different in the configuration of those two. Not just in the, the uh, my.conf, but the actual runtime values that are running in there. And not surprisingly, some of the path names that include host names for log files and PID files are going to be different. But here's a couple like thread stack and, and uh, InnoDB file format check that are also different between the two. Something I always look for is what's not there that I expect to be different between them, like server ID. If these are a couple of servers in my replication uh, cluster, and I didn't, <laughs> didn't remember to change the server ID on the slave, that could be a problem. MySQL summary. As a consultant, this is one of the first tools that I run when I come to an unfamiliar system. It, typically, you'd be familiar with your own system, but you'll also want to make sure that it's doing what, it, what you think it's doing. So this tells you all about the, the current status of that server at a glance. And I'm going to go through the output of that. It has a fairly lengthy output that reports to you in a familiar order and with all the information that you need to know 
a lot of parameters and uh, values that are associated with that running server. So basically, I have who am I connected as to run this command? What time did I run it? And the version, the exact version that it is running on that server. Uh, how many databases are on the server? And is this involved in replication? S seems a little funny to say, is not a slave, has zero la slaves connected, but you have to consider that there are median uh, steps in, in uh, complex replication environments. You could, some server could be a slave and be a master to further sl downstream slaves. It'll tell you some runtime information about who's connected at the time that you ran this command. So what were they doing? The sort of a process list kind of uh, output. Which users were connected? In this case, we have a bunch of application users and one replication user. We can definitely tell who that is. Which are the distinct host IP addresses that are connected? Which databases did they have uh, readied? The null indicates no default database, probably the replication user. Oh, for the example, I'm mixing in to make it more <laughs> diff, you know. OK. <coughs> you caught me. OK, so the next is I've uh, uh, shortened this for the sake of the slide, but this is actually like the show global status. It has a lot of variables that are output, and not only the absolute counters the, the per day, but also averages per second and per 10 seconds. Some other uh, variables that are associated with uh, Percona server features. In, in this case, I'm running stock MySQL, so a lot of these features are not supported. But if I were running Percona server on this instance on my virtual machine, it would have reported to you which features are in use and enabled. Uh, table cache, the top, how much it's being used at the current time. Uh, query cache, this is often uh, one that I, I look at. I don't much like the query cache because it gives less benefit to most people than they think it's giving. So I want to check the uh, hits to insert ratio. And if that's really, really low, maybe it's not getting the best use of that memory. Do you have a question? I was just going to say you could do a really nice plug right there with the top storage. Oh, good idea. <laughs> so not supported. Click here to upgrade. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So you're saying if I see the hit to insert ratio high, then I know it's thrashing, or is it low? No, I, I would look if it's low. Like it's 0%. In this case, 0%. Well, I have, I have no, no memory associated with my query cache in this example. But if, if there was 128 megabytes uh -huh. of query cache, and, it and it's only 20% full, and it's got only 2% hits to insert ratio, so that means it's, it's re having to put new data into the query cache many more times than it actually gives us some benefit by utilizing that cached data. Any cache, you want to get more hits for each insert uh, by a large uh, factor. You want to be able to make use of it two or three or 10 or 100 times for every one time you insert data. Yeah, so this gives you that, that ratio right there. Yeah, there's there's some disadvantage. I mean, the the query cache is a was a great idea at the time, but it's proved to not be as much benefit as people had hoped. So it's frequently the case that I recommend to customers to turn it off completely, just disable it. Yeah, question. Values that I would expect to see for the hits to insert ratio above 100 percent. Yeah, if it's above 100 percent, we're we're at least getting something out of it for each time we put something into it. And that would be my baseline. <laughs> I would want to see it higher than that, 300%, 800%. Part of the output of MySQL summary is to give you some very basic information about your schemas. Uh, how many database tables do you have? How many views do you have? How many are in InnoDB versus MyIsom? What types of indexes do I have? 
how many columns of each of the supported data types are there in this database. It's sort of simple information, but it would be troublesome to, to get that kind of information otherwise. It would take you, take you a while of combing through MySQL dump dash dash no data to get that information. Other optional technologies that may be present in your uh, MySQL server. Variables and statistics related to InnoDB, both static variables that are in your my.conf and also runtime variables like buffer pool fill, buffer pool dirty. Most of the rest of them are things that you would see in your configuration file. More InnoDB uh, runtime statistics, how, how much uh, I.O. is going on and, and other statistics. And finally, some MyISM uh, statistics, the key cache, how much is uh, the key cache is actually in use. Users, how many users are configured on the server? Do we use old passwords? Some of the information about binary logging, uh, what is the status of that? Here's a section called noteworthy variables. Not every single variable that exists in the uh, pantheon of configuration files, but the ones that are sort of the ones you'd want to look at uh, most frequently. And then finally, the literal content of your my.conf file. So if you wanted to compare what's in the configuration file to what's actually running, those could be different because somebody could have changed some dynamic variable without editing the conf file. Does this section call out differences, or is it simply print it for you to compare to what you saw previously? This just prints it for you to compare. It doesn't actually identify things that are different in the configuration file versus what's in runtime. Does the previous tool that you mentioned, the, uh, uh, the tool that compares configurations to running cert instances, can that also compare a config file versus a running instance? The config diff tool, as far as I know, it actually compares only the runtime, the, the dynamic variable status, um, not the files themselves, okay. because it's accessing the information remotely. To you know, it's you're running the script on one host and you're connecting to some number of other remote hosts, where it would have to use an SCP or something to get the configuration files, for as it can query the dynamic runtime variables remotely. Did you have a question? No. Yeah, actually, Percona Toolkit is on Launchpad, so you can go and submit feature requests and bugs and, and watch its progress and, and uh, see blueprints. So just like Percona Server and MySQL itself. <coughs> Moving on, <coughs> Variable Advisor. This is something which you can run to analyze the variables that are defined in your my.cnf or in your running MySQL instance. And then it, like the uh, query advisor, has a number of things that it knows to check for, sort of a series of heuristics that it looks, things that are often configured wrong and what to do about them. And the output looks like this. It'll report to you many of the uh, things that it finds in your configuration or your runtime variables. For example, uh, in uh, InnoDB is not configured in strictly ACID mode based on the uh, flush log uh, uh, variable there. Here's a uh, warning that the log file size is probably on my virtual machine, since I just installed it, is probably at the default, which is ridiculously small for a production server. So that's, so that's the sort of things that it checks, just to give you a heads up. And you can then take that and check it out Maybe it's by intention. Maybe it's something that you really need to change. Does it compare it to actual system resources, such as the amount of RAM available and things like that? That's a good question. Uh, does it compare it to the amount of resources available? So if you had your buffer pool size very small, but you were running on a very small profile machine, I don't know the answer to that. So that's homework for you. OK. <laughs> So more uh, examples of the output of Variable Advisor. It's just more of the same, but it, it's just a demonstration that it, it can be lengthy, and you want to look at each one of them in turn. Monitoring tools. It's a whole different group. Deadlock logger. We've all seen deadlocks reported in the InnoDB status uh, report. 
but they only get reported for the most recent uh, deadlock. If you have another one, it overwrites the report of the earlier one. And it isn't necessarily uh, terrifically easy to read. Deadlock logger attempts to make it more uh, easy to read and gives you the information you need. And it also can be run in a daemon mode. So it will continually look at the InnoDB status, find deadlocks that occur at 3 in the morning, and log them to a file so that you can review them when you wake up the next day. And this is very useful in case you get more or less frequent deadlocks and you want to know about all of them. Uh, you can you would not run it on the RDS instance. Yeah, you'd run it on another host, connect remotely to a uh, MySQL instance on RDS, and log it just the same way. I have not tried that scenario. That's homework for me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, RDS does not allow you to SSH in or access log files, so you would have to connect, you can only get things that you can get by connecting remotely. Yeah. Similar, foreign key error logging, which is also reported in the InnoDB status, but is also overwritten by subsequent foreign key errors. So this would also be something that could run in a daemon mode, monitor for those errors, and log them for you. <coughs> Mixed. That's a funny name. It comes from MySQL admin extended status. So the, the output of extended status is like saying show global status. It gives you all those status variables. But Mext has a, a particular usage that allows you to get intervals. Because what you're, you don't necessarily want to know how many uh, uh, foreign key or how many uh, reads or dirty pages dirty since the beginning of time, you want to know how many of those have increased in a given interval of time, like the last 10 seconds, or a s several successions of, of 10 seconds. It's much more useful for diagnosing something. Not only to spot a, a difficulty, some sort of bottleneck, but then when you make some tuning change to try to fix that bottleneck, now you can run this again and see if the, the per 10 seconds uh, increase in those counters has been relieved. So this is a very frequent tool to use for diagnosing problems and for verifying that you've fixed a problem. Query Digest. This is the great one. I say if you learn only one tool in Procodon Toolkit, make it this one. This is the one where you can analyze the uh, performance of, in aggregate of all your queries that are logged in the, in the slow query log. And back to your question, you can also get these queries from show process list, from TCP dump, from the general query log, although the slow query log is preferred because it has all the useful timing information in it. So you can use set global long query time equals zero if you're running 5.1 or later. That doesn't work in 5.0. And I say temporarily because I did have an emergency call recently where they said, our website is down, nothing's working. And we went in there and found the slow query log was taking up 200 gigabytes on their disk. And they were, their data directory has literally maxed out their, their drive. So we truncated the log file, and everything w went back to normal. Because somebody had enabled this and then went on vacation. <laughs> so we fixed that. So the, um, when you want to analyze the log, you should copy the log, the physical file of the log, to another server because the script that does all the statistical analysis is pretty resource intensive. I would not use, I would not run this on your production master database server. I would capture the log, move it over to some test server and run it there. Resource intensive in terms of disk I.O. or CPU? CPU and memory. Okay. But you happen to know you have a lot of those to spare and you're only I.O. bound and whatever. Oh. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'll even uh, put an addendum to my statement. I will not run this on a master production server again. <laughs> but don't you run it on another server to 
Well, it would be you're, you're accessing a log file on, that's produced on the master. So you know, the temptation and the most convenient thing would just be to run this Perl script on the same host where you find your log file, which I recommend against. <coughs> so what does the output of Query Digest look like? It's fairly long, so I'm going to go into it in some detail. The first section of Query Digest looks like this. It has just a, some, some uh, intro information, like when did you run this Query Digest, which is quite useful if you want to make reference to it some other time. How many queries were run? In this case, 88,000 queries. 229 queries uh, were unique. So of those 88,000, only 229 are unique. And the log file that it read was spanning about 55 minutes from 4 p.m. to 4.55. So that's a fairly busy server. This is actually taken from one of my customers' uh, sites, but I've changed a lot of the names and table names and things like that to be more anonymous. So the uh, ex execution time gives you some information about what's the total aggregate time that it spent executing queries in the server for all the queries in this log. What is the minimum and maximum duration of the queries? And other statistics, average, 95th percentile. 95th percentile is a little bit more interesting than max because there are outliers. There's maybe some extraordinary circumstance which made one query take 28 seconds. But if you say, well, 95% of the queries are taking less than uh, 20 milliseconds, that's a little bit more interesting than the outliers. Next line is how much time was spent acquiring locks. This isn't necessarily the same thing as the execution time. And in fact, lock time doesn't count toward uh, logging into the lo slow query log anyway. But it can be useful to know if you're experiencing a lot of lock time, it could be that you have my ISM tables, you have deadlocks, you have things are queuing up on locks. The next lines are rows sent and rows examined. What's the difference between that? It's how many rows are in result sets that get sent back to the client, the application, versus how many did it have to scan through in the tables in order to prepare those result sets. A very, very high ratio there could indicate that you're doing table scans to get small result sets. And then query size is the actual uh, size in bytes or megabytes of the result sets. Yeah, question? So I was going to ask you, um, let's say you have some query that's blocking a bunch of other queries, and it takes those queries to explode. Are you saying that that would not go out to the query database? Correct. Because block time is not the Right. I'll repeat your question. Uh, so the, the implication of lock time not factoring into the execution time is that if you have queries that are waiting on locks, that doesn't count toward them being slow. So if you, if you had a non-zero value for your long query time, if you set it to 10 seconds or something, you could have queries that are waiting for 10 seconds, but then once they actually get the lock, they execute rapidly, they never show up in the slow query lock. Does that answer your question? OK. Next section. This lists in order of which are your biggest heavy hitter queries, a block that uh, tells you uh, how much aggregate response time you can attribute per query. And in the example, I've highlighted a, a few numbers. You can see the uh, percentage total response time, the number of calls to this query, and the response time per call, which you can see forms an inverse relationship, something that takes a long time per call, 26 seconds, is only run 19,000 times. And yet, it, it, because they are the, each query is, on average, a lot longer running, it constitutes 65% of the total response time for this server. Versus the next line, which is a query that's run more frequently, but the average response time is much lower. Therefore, it's only 18% of the, the uh, response time, and so on. You see the percentage in the center of the output indicates the aggregate total response time of a percentage of the whole response time on that server. So now you see exactly which are your number one, number two, number three queries on that server, including both queries that are long running and queries that are quick but run frequently. It's a pretty common pattern that I see a lot that uh, the first two or three or five queries are vastly the majority of the uh, response time. And then it drops off quickly. So you, the past the first three to five, 
you start getting into the 2%, 1%, 0.1%. And those are all the sort of long tail of queries that uh, even if you were to attend to those and try to optimize them, how much can you possibly Im improve the, the aggregate performance of the system? 0.1%. But concentrating on the queries that <coughs> already account for 65% of the uh, response time on that server, that's where you want to spend your time to get better bang for your buck of the time that you spend analyzing queries, deciding what indexes you need, figuring out if your developers can uh, do some more caching intelligently, and relieve those queries. Naturally, if you get rid of those top ones, everything else bubbles up to the top, and other ones will now become the 25, 30, 40 percent of the total aggregate just by changing the proportions. But that's the process that you would go through. If you want to optimize the server, you need to know which are your top queries and then move on. The next section of query digest output is a series of blocks like this, one for each of the queries in the same order from top query down. You can see that at the top left it says query one. It gives me a lot of statistics about how many queries per second is, is this running of this query. What is the uh, uh, sort of a concurrency ratio of how many of them are running at the same time as one another in different threads. There's a concept called apdex, which is a measure of how well it's meeting some uh, 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 thresholds of what we consider a good query. That is, if it's a sec one second or less, it counts well. If it's within double that, it counts half as well. And if it's up uh, beyond that, it doesn't count at all as a good query. That apdex number goes from 0 to 1.0. So the closer to 1.0, the, the greater proportion of those queries are running within a suitable amount of time. 0 0.1, very bad. Uh, query time sparkline, I'll skip that for now and we'll come back to it. The time range, very similar to the time range that we saw at the top of the uh, report, which is of the log that we collected, when were these queries run? This one is almost the entire duration of the uh, log. Remember it was 4 p.m. to 4.55. This one's 4 p.m. to 4.48. Here's another section that's very similar to the uh, totals that were at the beginning of the output, but this is just for this one query type. How many times was it run? What is the aggregate execution time? Min, max, other statistics for execution time. Notice that the minimum execution time for this is two seconds. It's because I ran this on a uh, server that had the long query time set to two seconds. So they didn't catch any queries that were running in less than two seconds just because that's where I collected this data for, for the example. Uh, sim similar numbers for lock time, rows sent, rows examined. Is that Yes, and it'll probably... You deliberately constructed a full table scan to get these statistics, right? Right. Well, I'll show you why it only sends back one row on the next slide. Because I've had queries like that. Okay. So yeah, what, what database was uh, readied when this query was run? Which user or users executed this query? And then this section, query time distribution. This is a histogram of orders of magnitude of, of how long it took to run this query. Because queries take different amounts of time each time you run it, we want to know uh, like a bell curve of how many times did it take 10 milliseconds? How many times did it take 100 milliseconds? In this case, because we happen to have run this on a system that was set to uh, long query time two seconds, all of them are at least two seconds. And some of them are quite a lot longer than that, actually most of them. Continuing on from there, we see the next portion of this block it shows us the actual query that it, that it was running that elicited this uh, query profile. That's why it's running one row per query, because it's a count. Uh, so it shows you the exact uh, query that uh, ran. And also notice the line above. It has explain already <coughs> right there. So now you can take your mouse, you can highlight the explain plus the query, copy, paste that into your query tool. It even has this backslash capital G, so it gives you a better output. And it's very convenient. How about if you could do like a here doc that types into that other thing that has the nice output of the explain plan? That would be awesome. So if you could pipe this directly into 
visual um, explain. Yeah. That that is a uh, would be a great feature request. I've actually suggested that, but it would create a dependence so that now you would have to have both tools installed. So maybe it would be good for an optional thing. Uh, what it will do for you, if you run this command, query digest, dash dash explain, it will not only show you the query, but it will get you the explain plan for you in the old plain format. The lines above that show table status, show create table, the things that you probably most want to know when you're optimizing a query. Uh, and it will show you that for those lines for each of the tables that are involved in the query. If you're doing joins, it'll show you the show table status and show create table for all of the tables that you have in that query. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned the query explain, right? And sometimes <clears throat> a query you're trying to explain has subqueries in them which MySQL needs to run in order to know how many rows are, are returned, right? Right. <clears throat> Would the query explain let you know that it's going to run the subquery? Because sometimes those subqueries are Take a, small. take a long time. And yeah. you don't want to run it on a, your primary right. because that might cause damage, right? Would it, would it let you know that it's going to run those or it just goes ahead? Uh, good question. I'll repeat it for the everybody. The question was, when you uh, ask this query digest to give you a report of all the explained plans for all these queries, is it going to warn you or give you any kind of option to not run subqueries? Because those, as everybody knows, or hopefully, actually have to execute the subquery before it can give you the explained plan of the outer query, which can take a long time. No. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't give me any warning about that. It'll just get you all the explains, uh, which can be a problem. That would be a really great feature request. But uh, I can see how that might be complicated to know before you do uh, uh, explain whether it's going to involve a subquery. Unless you have an SQL parser. But it only runs explain if I do the dash dash explain. Correct. By default, it will just give you the, the query itself and not get you the explain, which means by default, you don't even have to be connected to a, a live database at all. You could capture this log, take it anywhere without any access to the database instance itself, and do the analysis. It's totally disconnected. Only if you want the explain plan does it have to connect to the database. Slave. Run the explain on a slave. Sure. Yeah, I've done that. If there's a slave which is less burdened and you can safely run the analysis without uh, worrying about competing for resources, then you can run the explains there. OK. So the last slide for about Query Digest is just that there's a, uh, many, many options to this uh, tool. You can do a lot of uh, customization as to which queries get profiled. You can do customization for how does it break them down. I, talked, I showed you examples of the default breakdown, which is by query fingerprint. And that means two queries that are identical except for constant values will show up as the same query uh, in terms of this aggregate. So select from table where primary key is 1, 2, 3. Select from table where primary key is 4, 5, 6 those will get aggregated together because they have the same fingerprint. You can also group by different things. One of the ones that I've used is grouping by the database. So if you have a, a site that has many databases and they have different amounts of traffic, like you're a hosting provider, and you want to know which of the databases gives you the most response time in aggregate so you can do load balancing or move databases around, you can just say dash dash group by DB. And that's a built-in field that It'll allow you to break down not by query fingerprint, but by the do subtotaling by database. And then it will give you the, that in ordered uh, from first to, to last. Yeah? So one of the weaknesses I find with the map kit was explaining how to use this with TCP dump and using it live, which mm -hmm. when you're having a problem with I personally use it live. I think it's reliable. Oftentimes the logs turned on and there's a process to it. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I'll repeat it for everybody. 
the idea is instead of analyzing slow query logs, you can also get query information by actually tapping into TCP dump and getting the traffic and then feeding it directly into, into PT Query Digest. Query Digest actually has a command line option for that to, to do that for you, to interpret TCP dump output as the set of queries. Unfortunately, TCP dump is a little bit unreliable when you have really high volume traffic going on. It can drop packets out of the, uh, what it reports to you. I think that's actually a deficiency of TCP dump, not of per kernel and toolkit. Also use the process and I put right. the time on and it yeah. And yeah. The the other option is to use process lists, so you can do a sampling of processes that are actually running on your live server if you don't have access to logs, for example. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know the internals well enough to answer that, whether it's using TCP dump binary data or, or text data. OK. OK, so back to process list. Uh, the, the difficulty with process list is that it only does sampling at intervals 10 times a second or so on. So if you have very, very quick queries, it's going to miss them. And it's also not going to give very accurate timing information for those queries, except to within a tenth of a second. You can change the interval. Yeah. It is very beneficial if there's no other option, but uh, I greatly prefer the slow query log. OK. Oh, and uh, the last uh, tip about Query Digest is instead of outputting in this textual format, you can actually save the results to a database table so that you can review them later and actually do queries against them. And also see the ones that you've already optimized before so you know which ones to ignore. So moving on, we're kind of running into uh, close to an hour here. So I'll keep going however long you want me to. Uh, replication tools. Replication needs a lot of help. <laughs> One of the issues with replication is that the seconds behind master is not exactly reliable. It doesn't tell you how many seconds behind master. It tells you how many seconds behind the last bin log that you fetched, which may not be the most recent bin log because it's still downloading bin logs. The way to solve this is with a tool like Heartbeat, which inserts a timestamp into a, a dummy table that flows through replication and gets to your slave. And now you can compare that timestamp on the slave to whatever is the current timestamp on the slave and gives you a much more accurate view as to how much up to date is the, uh, the slave to what has run on the master. As provided that the master is continuing to insert those uh, timestamps at a regular interval. And servers will crash yes, and both <laughs> servers have to be in sync. <laughs> the, yeah. Oh, good. Uh, so that way it's more or less always accurate. Yeah. So uh, using some uh, uh, heart, heartbeat timestamp that is not dependent on daylight savings time would be a good idea. It might actually already do that. We can, we can check later. OK. The next one, slave delay. It can be useful if you have situations where somebody inadvertently drops a table on your master to have a slave set up that doesn't actually process that command for, say, 20 minutes or an hour or two hours gives you some grace period to be able to recover that table uh, and then port it back to the master. It can be useful in those sort of situations, but it's a pretty rare case where you'd use this. Slave find. This gives you a output of a, uh, the web of all your slaves with replication between them. Uh, in an environment where you have many slaves with a very complex topology, multiple generations of slaves down, it can be very tricky to keep that. Usually you see somebody has a whiteboard that says, do not erase, and it has a, a, a tree structure looking with all the uh, masters and little port numbers written in very small. But this will actually give it that to you more accurately in case somebody didn't update your whiteboard uh, as quickly as they should have. Find slaves or slaves too? Yes. 
it will traverse the whole tree of slaves to, to get you that information. Slave restart. If you have a known error that's occurring on your uh, replication, and it's okay, and you're going to let that go through, but you just get tired of going on to your slave and saying start slave, uh, and you have to remember what the variable is that to get it to skip the... Uh, so I, I always have to look that up every time. So this tool just says when a specific error number occurs, skip that statement and restart automatically as many times as is necessary and optionally tell me about it. And it's just the error number, it's not, for example, a regex that matches some characteristic of the, that you could get duplicate key um, collisions, but it could be, I know that it happens on this table, oh my god, it happens on this table, please don't. It's the, error. yeah, it's the error number. It's just the error number. It's the error type, so I don't think that you can filter it for a specific table, it's, or, or for the full error message. I think it's so error. That information is actually available in the, Yes, it is. If, but uh, I think the usage of this tool is for the error number in general. Okay. Yeah. You're doing this as a cron? How do you run this? You can, if you're having a problem, you can just run it ad hoc at the command line, and it will go until you're tired of it, and you can hit Control C, or you can run it from cron, uh, or as you know, continually just run it in the background, and it runs 24 hours a day. You can do ignore errors, but this will also uh, do some logging for you and has some other configuration that gives you a little bit more flexibility about what it will search for. I believe so. I'm going to put a footnote by that statement. We, we can check later. OK. Table checksum. The other problem with replication is that it goes out of sync. You can have data that uh, is different on the master and the slave, and MySQL doesn't detect this or tell you. And then it snowballs, because now you are doing insert into this table from select from this other table, which is wrong, and you, you have propagating uh, mistakes over and over again. So this will actually do checksums of tables or of chunks of tables and calculate the checksum with statement-based replication taking advantage of the fact that statement-based replication can involve non-replication-safe commands, the statement flows through to the slave, does the same checksum against ostensibly the same set of rows. If they're identical, then the checksum should match. It, in both cases, it stores it into a, uh, a temp table or a, um, a dummy table. And now you can go on to the slave after you run the checksum and see, are there any cases where the same chunk of rows was different when we calculated it on the uh, master versus the slave. And there's a self-join that you can do to, to do that that's documented in there. Question? Um, did you ever run that checksum for over a hundred I run this checksum every Saturday on a 250 gig database. It takes, a, I think it's taking up to three hours to do the complete database. Uh, it does uh, it in chunks though, right? You can optionally specify to do it in chunks. So it doesn't do the checksum against the entire table in one go, although it can. But you can tell it, I want to do it in 100 row chunks or 1,000 row chunks or however you choose to split it up, which limits the... Um, duration of how long it takes to do that checksum. In case you have MyISM tables, you don't want to lock the table for that period of time. Or, yeah, and you can also do other uh, configurations like only do 7% of the database. Uh, so it's, it's going to do uh, a sampling of the database, either round robin or random sampling. And now you can just run this nightly. And eventually, you'll have, in theory, checksums the entire database, but not every night. But, but the, the um, blocks are also very useful. If you've done that non-deterministic insert into select that you were talking about earlier, you need to find the needle in the haystack. The great thing about doing the, um, the blocks is it'll pinpoint which record it was right. or get you real close to it. Right. So you you know, to repeat, the, you know, doing the checks up against limited size blocks allows you to pinpoint which data is out of sync, which will allow you to sync them up 
which is a great segue to table sync, which utilizes the data that was collected in table checksum, finds the ch chunks that differ, and then generates just the alt, the, uh, the, not the alters, but the uh, replace command that it would take to get them back into sync. What it does is the data that exists on the master is treated as canonical. It uses replace statements, which should be a no op on the master. It's replacing that row with exactly the same columns that it already has in that row, which is a no op on the master. It flows through to the slave and runs on the slave, which either inserts a row that was missing or corrects a row that was not correct. And therefore, it uh, syncs up the uh, database. I guess the only thing it won't sync up is if you drop table on the master. Well, you only need to maintain integrity for the chunk, uh, the, the size of the chunk you have. That's why it works through replication, because it's going to be doing that at a point in time so that the, the data of that chunk should be identical on the master versus the slave, regardless. Because the, once it does checksum, it inserts that result into a table. So that whole thing has transactional integrity written to the, yeah. uh, the replication log. It has to happen in the same sequence in time right. that all the other events happened in. The checksum is calculated as of a given point in time which then immediately inserts into a log table and flows through to the slave. And at the same bin log position does the calculation of against the same chunk of rows. So they have to be identical if they're in sync. You just check it by hand. You just say, just send to a file. That's what I did. Yeah. The yeah. And the, you check it and it's right. Yeah. There's two different ways of running the uh, table sync. One is output the series of replace statements that you're, you think you want to run and let me eyeball it, or execute the replace statements and actually run them on the master and they'll, they'll flow through to the slave. So it's, it's going to be good to give you some assurance. One of the issues I found with table checks on was that it computes the minimum and maximum value for, for each table, right? So <clears throat> in big tables, on a very busy server, there was the affecting the performance. Mm -hmm. I suggested it, but uh, so far I didn't even get a reply. Just to do a select min and max on a slave. You don't really care about maybe a few more, which are on the uh, a few less, which are on the slave, but they're on the master right now. But if it tells you the min and max, which are only used for the chunk size, right? Uh, this the, the divided chunks. Yeah. Reduce the amount of uh, load on the master. That's. That can be useful you know, to, to do some calculations of the overall table size on the slave versus the master. But the tricky part of that would be to get them to be at the right bin log position, because they're not necessarily in sync uh, when you do that query. But wouldn't it give you the chunk, just the chunk size you said, not the? If it's just to calculate the chunk size. So you have, you have say you have uh, 200 million rows in a table, mm -hmm. right? And you, you want to know the minimum is the minimum ID is one or ten thousand, whatever it is, yeah. and the maximum is two hundred million, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just, so uh, the checksum <coughs> script will uh, will divide in chunks and do it sequentially, but that getting that values of the minimum ID and the maximum ID mm -hmm. when doing it on the master on big tables, which are on a very active server, impacts performance. True. Wouldn't those generally be indexed? Though? I mean, they're, they're, because Still. you're going to be dividing by them. It's Still. the primary key. It should. Is it fast finding? Uh, it can be. Uh, it can be impacting. Sure. So it's it's something that could be moved to the slave for that purpose. Um, I think the the only tricky part is now you have to connect to two different servers at the same time, I, I, and the I, risk factor that the slave is out of sync as well. So it's 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 a legitimate feature request, but it's probably not the highest priority. Okay. I provided the patch, but oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Shall I move on? I, I think we're already over an hour, so I'll pick up the pace a little bit. The next group is what I call system tools. They aren't necessarily specific to MySQL. A lot of these came from the Asperza toolkit, so they're more about uh, Linux system configuration and profiling. I don't think that Procona Toolkit actually supports Windows currently, because you need to have Shell and Perl in order to run. And you can sort of fake it with Sigwin or something, 
but there's there's significant things which are Linux specific. <laughs> so here's one that is is really crucial for a lot of uh, diagnostics of uh, system problems. Collect. So here's an example of running it. I run it with uh, some you know options that are mandatory on the command line for some reason and specify a directory that I want to save them into. And I say ls in that directory, and I see how many files it, it collected information about. Everything from df and disk stats, iostat, lsof. These are all Linux commands. So this is a great example of something that's not going to be applicable on Windows. Netstat, uh, a few things that are MySQL, like MySQL admin, which is the show global variables, the show global status. Lots of other system diagnostics process list, uh, PS, top. So all of these are run. These are things that you could run yourself, obviously, but they're all run more or less at the same time. So if something happens, running all these very rapidly at the same time and putting them into appropriate files and time, time stamping them can be very, very useful to get a full picture of everything that you would want to know about this system at the time that something was going wrong. So speaking of when something is going wrong, how do we know when to run this to collect all the data? That's another tool called stock. <laughs> because there was already a tool called wait. And this is something which can, uh, continually looks at your, your show global status and looks for a variable that you specify going above a value that you think is too high. So for example, it has a configuration file. So I say, I want to know if the threads connected goes over 100. And if that happens, kick off PT collect. And then wait again for that to happen. So stock will just sit in the background. See, I'm putting in the background. And it will just keep on watching the uh, status for that variable going over that value that you specified. And then if that happens, it'll kick off uh, collect. And into that same directory. So then you come back the next morning, you find six sets of those, all those 30 files, and you see, oh, that happened six times last night. And you can start doing some diagnostics. How often does it actually check for those states? How often does it pull? It's configurable. I think there's a default of 30 seconds. You, have, you look like you have a question you're about to come out. <laughs> So this is awesome. You can not have to wake up in the 3 in the morning to, to spot problems. You can have it collect as much diagnostic data as you can possibly sift through uh, and look at it the next morning. And speaking of sifting, there's a little uh, another tool which helps you browse through the uh, collected data that you got from collect. So you say sift, the directory that you have all these samples in, it shows you, wow, there's uh, 16 uh, sets with different timestamps, choose one of them. And then you choose one of them, and it lets you browse through all the diagnostic data associated with that timestamp. Can you make stock do other things? Making stock do other things is a little tricky. It's, uh, it, it needs to undergo some, some uh, refactoring, because the way that uh, I have used it to watch for other things, like I, was, I needed to spot InnoDB mutex weights. I had to go into the stock command and start hacking shell to, instead of running show global status, show in a DB status and grep for semaphore weights. And if that, is, you know, grep minus C, which reports the number of matches, and if that's over zero, is it more than zero, then kick off the collect. So it was a one line change, but it, it takes some creativity to come up with the right command to run. The, as we go forward, uh, stock is going to become a lot more intelligent about being I'm a good stalker. <laughs> <laughs> the good kind of stalker, yeah. OK, next one, disk stats. Not much to say about this. It uh, summarizes slash proc slash disk stats when, and allows you to browse through that in a much more meaningful way, uh, which is very handy. It's a little bit like IO stat, but it gives you some more fine-grained view into different types of statistics, like show me reads versus writes, which IOSTAT merges into one statistic. Have to incremental data or 
it can uh, it can go it can pull like iostat does. FIFO split. If you've got a really really large file and you want to split it up and process it in chunks, like say a 200 gigabyte log file, this can help you to do that without actually physically having to copy out chunks of it. Uh, so you can process that with a command in a shell script with a loop. PT summary. I'm picking up the pace a little bit because we're going a little long. Uh, this is very similar to MySQL summary, whereas MySQL summary told you about the status and configuration of your MySQL instance. This is much more about your Linux instance. So information about general system information, the version architecture is SE Linux in, uh, running. This one I ran on my VirtualBox instance, so it tells me that it's, I'm running in a VM environment. Um, I have logged into customer's sites and say, C, and I see from this output, CPU 64-bit, OS 32-bit. <laughs> and, and they say, why aren't we using all of our memory? Well, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> so what processors do I have? How many cores do I have? Uh, that can, that's useful information. It's a little bit inconvenient to get all this information in one place otherwise, but it's, it's very handy to run this. This is another command that I run as information gathering when I come onto a new system. How much memory do I have? How much of it is being used? What's my virtual memory situation? File systems. How full are they? What are my disk schedulers set to? CFQ, default on Linux, probably not the best performance for data directory. You want to use um, deadline or no op. Disk partitions, uh, inodes, LVM volumes. Gives you all that information in one place. More information about your network configuration and statistics. Top. Shows you the, the processes that are the chewing up your resources currently. And the end is VM stat. And the first thing I look for here is swap, SI and SO. I had an issue today where it was uh, using a lot of swap because they had overcommitted their uh, buffer size much, much larger than their physical memory. TCP model. This is an interesting tool. I have not actually used this yet, but it allows you to, like with TCP dump, capture the traffic that's coming and going and try to build a model so you can get a, a view of the dialogue that's going on between client and server and, and diagnose certain uh, problems that way. And the last section that I have is utility tools. Archiver. I, I use this a lot. This allows you to efficiently pipe data from a table that you want to remove data from into some other destination so that you can efficiently and without burdening the master system too much, reduce the amount of data that you have. I have a, uh, I'm doing this actually tonight via cron uh, to reduce the size of a 50 gigabyte table uh, moving bits and bits of it that are older rows into another destination and then I'll do a, a MySQL dump of that on the slave and uh, that'll preserve the archive data. But the nice thing about this is that it whittles away. It, it goes in small chunks of, of the data so that you don't have to impact your live system as much as you would if you just did a block of uh, all the data that you want to archive. You can archive to a file. You can archive to another table that could be on a remote host. So uh, the way I'm using it tonight, I'm copy copying rows from the table to another table on the same instance, and then I'll um, do away with that. Uh, yeah. Does this have some I.O. performance hit? Yes, it does. So I'm actually running. That's why I'm running it in the wee hours tonight. So uh, and I actually have uh, two cron jobs, one to start it at midnight and the other one to stop it at 5 AM. And there's a dash dash stop uh, command, which will get it to stop wherever it's at. And then it can resume the next night. And you kind of use it in an application where you're keeping two copies of the same table in sync. Will it 
check the target table or anything like that, or is it just basically assume that there's an empty table or something? It, it's going to assume that there's another empty table. So it's going to just select a row, insert it there, and once it's certain that it's succeeded, because you don't want to lose data in the, in the shuffle, then it will delete it from the old uh, table. Yeah. I was kind of curious the difference is that like would you believe the ignores and then other table syntax um, to like to keep it, uh, a table uh, in sync would be two different or I guess in this case it might be the uh, sort of always the same as the map and then the next table would be potentially keep the two in sync. Right. The table sync uh, flows through replication. Yeah. So it's it's much better for getting uh, master and slave in sync. This is just copying data from one to the other. They don't necessarily have to have, be a, have a replication relationship to each other. Yeah. So in case some of the rows are already there, it'll still work. Yeah. Okay. Find. Just like. Uh, find on the command line for files. This does find on SQL tables that have certain criteria and then executes actions against them. Does it have the same tortured predicate logic as that? <laughs> yeah. Witness the tortured predicate logic. So uh, yes, the, and these are different predicates than you would find in, in GNU find, but they are pertaining to uh, tables. So. Here's the second one here is a table that has not been accessed, has not been modified in more than 30 days, and it's an InnoDB table. Exec execute alter table engine equals my isom. So you can get pretty complex just like you can with find. There's also another tool that's uh, analogous. So instead of looking for tables that match a certain predicate, you can search for processes that match a certain predicate and do something with them. So if something has been running for more than 60 seconds, please kill it or tell me about it. And various other predicates. Log player. If you've got a slave that you are about to promote to master and you want to warm up the buffer pool to match the pages that are on your master, you can take the log from the master, replay all the select statements on the slave, and it will naturally get the same mix of uh, pages into the buffer pool approximately, which is better than not. And now you can promote your slave to master without having to worry about warm-up time so much. Log is it general log or? Could be general log, could be slow query log, whichever you have. But it has to be log. Yeah. You can query that, get to that one and run the select. Exactly. Uh, in fact, yeah. Query yeah. Digest has, an, uh, instead of doing a big report for Query Digest, you could just say output the queries that you find. So you could collect your queries from TCP dump using Query Digest on the master, hype that over to a, a fake log file, which you then process in so log play. Exactly, yeah. <coughs> but this can do things like uh, don't run any updates, because we don't have. Query Digest. True. Quick question. Uh, yeah. How's that different than the old uh, slave feedback type from the master? Or is this basically the same thing? This is sort of uh, a little bit more general purpose. The slave prefetch concept is uh, if we have things coming in through the binary log before doing an update, convert it into a select and get the buffer pool, get the page into the buffer pool, and then in theory the update should be quicker. Unfortunately, the theory and the reality don't quite match. It, it, I've never seen that tool give as much benefit as was promised. Uh, so it must be in a very rare circumstance that it actually makes a difference. But log player is a little bit more general purpose. You can use it for other things too. Yeah. Percona server has a cache warming feature where you, you can dump out the contents of the buffer pool to disk, okay. and then you can shut down, do some maintenance, whatever you need to do, bring back up, and then load that contents of the buffer pool to warm up the buffer pool much quicker than it would through natural uh, running queries. But I I don't think you can transfer that uh, serialized buffer pool from a master to a slave and then magically have it work. 
because the pages aren't necessarily going to be the same pages between the master and the slave. For the same logical data, they could be stored in physically different pages. Yeah. You can do some filtering. You can ensure that updates are not going to execute, uh, so it's only going to do reads. Uh, so it has a bunch of options. Any other questions? Good. That's it. That's all the uh, the tools we've got through all the tools in Percona Toolkit. All right. that was good. So it's it's going forward into the future. There's a 2.0 on the horizon. You can go onto uh, blueprintslaunchpad.net, Percona-toolkit, see what's in the pipeline. For example, uh, two of the uh, things that are already available in beta are some redesigns for PT stock, like we talked about, and some improvements to table checksum that makes it a lot more reliable. And if you know anybody who really wants to work on Percona Toolkit and is really good with MySQL, Perl, and Shell, direct them to this URL. I well, uh, I put my slides up on slideshare.net slash Bill Carwin. I wanted to give a uh, mention that Percona is putting on a conference in April in Santa Clara in the same venue that we used to go to for the MySQL conference. Same week, same place. You can go to percona.com slash live to get notified about it and register. And also, you're welcome to check out my book that I published last year. And for all of you, there's a 20% off discount that's good through Friday. The nice thing about purchasing it this way is that you have access to the ebook, uh, Kindle, Mobi, PDF, which is not available on Amazon. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>